He was Georgia's first New South governor, and he guided the state through an era of great change. Carl Edward Sanders, Sr. was born in Augusta in 1925. Smart and athletic, he won a football scholarship to UGA. When World War II interrupted his studies, Sanders enlisted in the Army Air Force, and he trained as a B-17 bomber pilot. After the war, he returned to UGA, and while in law school there, he met Betty Bird Foy of Statesboro. They married in 1947 and settled in Augusta, where Sanders entered politics. He was elected to the State House in 1954 and the State Senate in 1956. Only six years later, at just 37 years old, the charismatic Sanders was elected governor. A strong and progressive leader, Sanders focused first on education and reforming state government. He also supported civil rights. Sanders' political career looked very promising, but a re-election defeat in 1970 turned him from public office to the law and other ventures. He established his own law practice, now a prestigious international law firm, and threw himself into business and civic endeavors. Now in his 80s, Sanders is still active and engaged in the law and business, enjoying life in a modern Georgia he helped create. Governor Sanders, I'm so happy you're here for this conversation. Please know how much I appreciate your time. You have had a very distinguished career as a politician and as a lawyer and a businessman. Which do you prefer, politics or law and business? Well, politics is the most exciting thing you could be involved with. Law practice is the most satisfying thing that you could have. And business is, is good also. But I enjoyed my political years. I enjoyed my professional years as a lawyer. And I've enjoyed uh, being involved in some businesses, real estate and some other things with my son. So I think I'd put them in the order of uh, politics, uh, law, and business. And business. You were born in May of 1925 in Augusta, Georgia. You were the oldest of two boys, and your father was a meat salesman for Swift. He did not lose his job during the Depression. So can you think back, being one of the fortunate ones during the Depression, what was it like? Well, I cannot think back that my father's salary was cut half in two like everybody else at the meat plant. Mm -hmm. But I do remember that we had, uh, he had purchased a small brick bungalow on the uh, corner of Johns and Riceboro Road in Augusta. And instead of being able to, to buy it, they had to turn it back to the insurance company and rent it. Now, I did not realize that as a youngster. My mother never let me know that uh, they were struggling like everybody else was struggling. And I had a good childhood. I walked to school. School was uh, not too far from where we lived. Were you a good student? I guess I was a good student, but I didn't carry myself out as being a, uh, an intellectual at that stage or even at this stage. You were busy being a kid? I was busy being a kid. And an athlete. You were a great athlete. In fact, you spent a lot of time at the YMCA. Tell me about it. My mother was a smart woman. She enrolled me in the Learn to Swim class at the Augusta YMCA. Back in those days, all of the athletic programs were put on by the Y. They were not in the public schools. So I went to the Y and learned how to swim. I played on the YMCA football team, basketball team, baseball team, and as a result, when I got out of grammar school and went to high school, I was able to play football in high school to the extent that uh, I got a football scholarship to the University of Georgia to go to college. Would you have gone to college if you didn't have that football scholarship? I doubt it, and not the, the fact that I probably would have wanted to go but the fact that my family was not in a position to send me. I don't think I'd have gone to college if I had not gotten that football scholarship. Unfortunately, your college career early on was interrupted to serve in World War II, and you went and you trained to be a pilot, a bomber pilot. Everybody wanted to be a pilot. We took all these tests of dexterity and so forth, some written tests, and I knew I wasn't going to get to be a pilot when I got through with those exams. 
some of my friends said, oh, I, I'm sure I'm going to be a pilot. Well, I got selected as a pilot. They got selected as a bombardier and a navigator. <laughs> I was 19 years old. I was the first pilot of a 10-man crew. The B-17 Flying Fortress, uh, one of which just came through Atlanta this last weekend on display, mm -hmm. was the largest plane at that time in World War II. You never saw combat, though. No, Did, I were didn't. you somewhat relieved or disappointed? I was disappointed. So was my crew disappointed because we finished up combat training in Dyersburg, Tennessee. We were scheduled to embark from Savannah to the 8th Air Force. The war, they dropped the bomb, uh, and a hydrogen bomb in Japan, and of course the, the war in Europe was, was coming to an end. And I said, I'm going back to college. Let me jump in quickly, because you actually were able to test out well, of I, many classes because of your military training, almost fast-forwarding your college career. That's correct. I really actually had a year of undergraduate work before going into the service. When I came out of the service, they said to me and all other veterans who returned, we will give you examinations, and everything that you can pass, we'll give you college credit. I was able to take enough exams and looked up and passed enough of them that I qualified for law school by having one more quarter <laughs> in undergraduate school. I went to law school. And again, they told me something that they don't do now. Mm -hmm. They said, law school is a three-year course. But since you veterans have come back from the war, if you want to, we will allow you to go two years around the clock, 12 months each year, and complete the three-year course. I completed the three-year law school course in two years. I took the bar exam, which you can't do now. You have to wait till you graduate. At, technically, at the end of my second year, and I looked up and passed the bar exam, I knew then that I was able to practice law, so I proposed to my wife, who I had met when I returned from the service. Tell me about meeting Betty. This is a cute story. Well, I was dating a girl from Atlanta. She was a Chi Omega. That's a sorority. And we had a date, and for some reason, uh, we disagreed on something, and uh, I left the Kyle Omega house and said, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, my friend who I played football with dates a girl at the Tridelt house, which is about a block down Millage Street in Athens. So I went down to the Tridelt house, and Mike Cooley was there with his girlfriend, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I've just left the Kyle Omega house, and I came down here to see what was going on. And I said to Nan, who was Mike's girlfriend, do you think there's anybody upstairs that might come down and talk with me at this time? She went upstairs, and she brought down this long-legged, beautiful girl from <laughs> Statesboro, Betty buried Foy, and I took one look at her and thought, well, this is, this is the <laughs> luckiest day of my life. And so I started dating her, and uh, as I said, we got married in September of 1947, and I picked up my degree uh, in June of 48. Right after we got married, she got very sick. Very sick, for a number of years. Yeah, and... Uh, we struggled. I practiced law during the day, and because Betty was sick and she'd take these expensive drugs that they, they Very expensive antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I taught law school at night. I taught law school at the Augusta Law School three nights a week from 9 to 10 o'clock. That was to make ends meet, wasn't it? That was to make ends meet. And, uh, of course, fortunately, she got better. And she recovered, and we were living in Augusta. And Augusta, of course, at that time was, I had no political ambition. Not one, you said. Well, you quickly found out that the Cracker Party was in control in Augusta. Well, I knew that to a certain extent, but I didn't realize that they were so controlling that if you wanted to get a job with the city or the county, you had to go through the Cracker Party. 
So a group of young World War II veterans said, you know, we don't think that's right. Let's start an independent party. So there was an independent party created, mostly made up of World War II veterans, and they asked me to be a part of that, and they asked me to run for the House of Representatives. How were you received when you arrived at the House, at the State House oh, in 1954? I was received uh, as uh, probably one who was not going to go along with the <laughs> the administration that at that time was uh, Marvin Griffin was the governor who I later ran against and I was perceived as one who would not follow the line that uh, they might always want you to vote and I didn't. Well you spent one term two years in the state house and then you decided to run for the Senate. Now this is state interesting. Senate. Yep. You were out of District 18, Senate District 18 and at the time the seat basically rotated between three counties in that district. So after your first term, it looked like you would have to give up that seat. But something unique happened. Explain. You're pretty good. You've I'm got working. a good, good, good history. <laughs> the 18th senatorial district was made up of Richmond, Jefferson, and Glasgow County. As you said, they all rotated in the state except one, and that was Fulton County. I ran for the seat from Richmond County, had opposition, won the Senate seat, took my seat in the Senate, served that for two years. The next county that came up was Jefferson County. I asked the Jefferson County uh, Democratic Committee if they would allow me to represent them and run for the Senate. They passed a resolution allowing me to become the senator representing them. I did the same thing when the Glasscock County came up. That gave me six years in the Senate. Which was an enormous amount of seniority. That's that right. That others didn't enjoy like That's you did. That's right. The average senator rotated out. The last two years, I was elected president pro tem of the Senate, and that's when I began to think about, I either need to get in this political business or get out because what I was doing while I was in the Senate mm -hmm. was going home on the weekend, trying to practice law during the weekend, going back to Atlanta during, during the Senate, and I knew that I couldn't keep that up. I was either going to lose my law practice or I was going to get out of politics or get into politics. Well, did it dawn on you in your mid-30s that you were one of the most powerful men in Georgia, clearly one of the most powerful men in the, in the state Senate? I didn't realize that. <laughs> I thought I was up here doing a job that the people had sent me up here to do. Let me ask you this. During your time in the Senate, you served as uh, Governor Ernest Vandiver's floor leader as well as President Pro Tem, but it was during that time that Governor Ernest Vandiver had to decide whether he was going to admit two African Americans to UGA or close the school, and he called a meeting at the mansion and you were there. Tell me what happened. That was a very significant meeting. He called a meeting at the mansion, and there were 50 political leaders from around the state. And he said, I've got to decide whether to shut down the University of Georgia or allow these students to be enrolled. The federal judge had mandated that they be allowed to enroll. He went around the room took a vote from every individual as to whether they would oppose closing the university or agree to close the university. Forty-eight out of fifty said shut the university down. Two of us, my vote and the vote of Frank Twitty of Camilla, Georgia, said you can't shut the University of Georgia down. Vandiver said I'll think about it called me up a day later and said, I've thought about it, and I realize that I'm not going to shut the university down. That was a very significant vote in the history of Georgia, and I give Ernest Vandiver credit for saying that he was not going to shut it down because he had run a political campaign in which he had said that no, not one, not ever one. But he took meaning the, no African Americans in white schools. That's right. But he took took the advice 
I told him if he shut the University of Georgia down, we'd have a generation of illiterates in this state, and we couldn't afford to have that. So he did not shut it down, and then I, of course, was elected the year after that. All right, let's, let's talk about that. You just kind of brushed over that. You started out running for lieutenant governor, but you switched and ran for governor. Why? Well, it was a very practical reason. I started out running for lieutenant governor because I thought that was the race that I probably had the best chance to win. Because Marvin Griffin, a very popular governor who had been in office before and, and sat the, out and, and came and the back. lieutenant governor, Garland Byrd, were already announced candidate for governor. I was campaigning for lieutenant governor down in middle Georgia, and uh, one of the newspaper publishers who came to me and said, you hear what happened in Atlanta today? And I said, no, what happened? They said, Carl F. Sanders, a former Atlanta policeman who's now a lawyer, has announced that he's going to enter the race for lieutenant governor. Well, I said, well, that's funny. That means that uh, a voter would have to go in the polls and decide whether he's going to vote for Carl E. or Carl F. It was a political trick which, of course, my opposition was playing. But it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me because I realized I couldn't run for lieutenant governor with another Carl Sanders in the same race. So I thought about it, and I said, well, if they're going to play the game that way, I'll just get in the governor's race. So September of 1962, just a couple of weeks before the primary, CBS reporter Harry Reasoner shows up in Georgia, and he looks at you and he says, I'm doing a documentary on you because you're going to be the next governor. I That's what it, the polls say, and you were stunned. I said, you've got to be crazy. I, I don't have any idea who's going to win the race, but I, why do you say that? He said, because we've had Art, uh, Lou Harris do a political mm -hmm. poll, and he says you're going to win. I said, well, you go back to Lou <laughs> Harris and tell him, he must know something that I don't know because I'm going to keep on campaigning because I don't know who's going to win this race. But he did. And candidly, he came up with numbers. The race came out almost identical with the numbers that Lou Harris had uh, predicted. So you win. And here you are, 37 years old, youngest governor in the country, handsome, successful, charismatic. Did you even have any <laughs> idea? You didn't even know. You didn't even know how charismatic you were. But did you have any idea at 37 you would be a governor of the New South? No, I didn't. I uh, happened to be at the right place at the right time when Georgia needed a candidate who represented the future and who believed in the, the opportunity for this state to grow and prosper. And I knew at that time that uh, I was in a very fortunate position because there were so many other governors in the South that were doing things that were contrary to what I wanted to see done in Georgia, and they were going down roads that uh, appeared to me to be self-destructive, and I did not want to be a part of that. You immediately went to work trying to remodel education, particularly higher education. You spent 60 cents on every dollar on education. Why was that so important to you? Education is important to me because I think education equates with freedom. I think that anybody that uh, becomes educated has more freedom than somebody who has not had educate, education as a basis of their life. I knew that uh, the more people we could educate in Georgia, the better off the state would be in e every capacity politic-wise, business-wise, otherwise. So I, I had gone to California when I was in the Senate on one of these trips, and I studied the community college program in California where anybody in California could go to a two-year community college tuition-free if they wanted to. That was one of the main programs that I wanted to see put into place in Georgia. So we put it in place and built some 12 or 15 junior colleges and elevated four or five junior colleges to senior colleges. And of course, in addition to these community colleges, we built these vocational technical schools close by where a kid could either stay home and go to the junior college or go to the technical school. And that's uh, a very, that was very important to me and I think important to the people in the state of Georgia. And it's paid off. 
the schools that uh, we created, most all of them have grown and prospered. Many boys and girls, because of those community colleges that we created, stayed here in Georgia and returned great benefits to their state where before they had to leave Georgia and go somewhere else in order to either get an education or get a job. You also set about to put airfields throughout the state because while you were traversing the well, state during was, your campaign... that was sort of an interesting uh, program. I went to the federal government when I got elected governor and asked them if they had funds available for com community airports. They told me they had some money in Washington for that type of program. I went to the county commission association and said to the county commissioners, how about participating in building some community airports? They said, no, we were interested in roads, not airports. I said, well, let me tell you something. I'll get the state to put up half the money and get the feds to put up the other half of the money. And all you've got to provide is a strip of land that will accommodate 3,000-foot runway. Will you do that? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll do, do that. that. We had the number one airport, community airport development program for four solid years in the entire country. Instead of 30 mm -hmm. paved airports, when I left office, we had over 100 paved airports in Georgia. And we brought in enough industry. It, it, it was unbelievable the amount of industry that we created because we had these community airports all over Georgia. You also brought in sports teams, professional sports teams. Well, that's an interesting story. I, I had something to do with uh, every sport, major league sport that came to Georgia. Then I'm out of politics, and I'm practicing law. Hold on. I want to talk about your relationship with John F. Kennedy. There was rumor at, at one point that you may be even a running mate for him. Is there any truth to that? Well, not to my knowledge. I had a lot of people tell me that, but no, Jack Kennedy didn't sit me down and tell me that uh, he wanted me to uh, consider running for vice president. I did know at that time that there was a lot of movement against Lyndon Johnson. The one who really didn't like Johnson was Bobby Kennedy. Jack Kennedy got along pretty much with everybody, but on the other hand, Bobby Kennedy never did anything that Jack Kennedy didn't know what he was doing. But you also established a very good relationship with Lyndon Johnson as well. When Lyndon took over as president, had you out to the ranch and, uh, in Texas, and he actually had you sit next to his wife when he gave his first major address to Congress. I got acquainted with Lyndon Johnson for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons I got acquainted with him was when he ran for president in 1964. I was head of the Democratic Party. I was governor of the state. I thought, of course, that our senators and our congressmen and anybody else who was high up in the Democratic Party would support the Democratic nominee. Well, much to my surprise, Senator Russell went to Spain and spent the summer over in Spain inspecting military bases. Senator Talmadge went underground and uh, disappeared from the political scene. That left me alone to either continue to support the Democratic Party or to turn my back on them. The Democratic Party had been good to Georgia. Lyndon Johnson had been good to Georgia. The Appalachian Governor's Commission, he made, I made, made me chairman of that. I got oodles of money for hospitals and schools in North Georgia and other things. And when he came to Georgia, I was not going to turn my back on him and say, I don't want to see you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Barry Goldwater was running as a candidate against him. So when I did that, I knew in my heart that I was doing something that might not please everybody in the state. But I was doing something. I was repaying a debt that I felt like that the state owed to the candidate for the president at that time. Let's talk about why you felt like you may have paid a price there. You ha Again, at the time that you were running, 
or you were in politics, you could not serve two consecutive terms as governor. So you served from 63 to 67, by many standards, very successful. You sat out for four years, and then you decided to come back in 1970, and you were running against Jimmy Carter at the time, who ultimately painted you as a liberal, much more liberal than he, and essentially played the race card for you. Uh, at the time, I felt disappointed. But what happened was that I and I said to myself, I've been looking after the people's business for low many years. I've now lost the only election that I've ever run in. I'm going to build a law firm. And you did. And I founded a law firm here in Atlanta. I hired two lawyers to start out with, and that's been that was 1967. Today, there's 650 lawyers in that firm, and we are all over the country and all around the world. Do you have any regrets about your career, politically or otherwise? No, I don't have any regrets about my career, politically or otherwise. The, the only disappointment in my life that I really feel strongly about is I lost my 25-year-old grandson a year ago to cancer. And the thing that I admired about him, he never complained about it. Are you satisfied with the state of Georgia today? I'm satisfied that Georgia and Atlanta stands heads above the rest of the southern states in so many ways. I'm not satisfied with the educational opportunities. I still think that there's room in Georgia to educate more of our young people than we do. I think that there's room in Georgia to develop more industry than we have. I think there's room in Georgia to have a better transportation system than we have. And with that, Governor Carl Sanders, I need to say thank you so much for this conversation. Well, thank you. I don't know how much good it's going to do, but I've enjoyed it. <laughs>